Spotlight, lectures and performances on and around Albany State University. We are fortunate to have with us three members of the General Assembly. Uh, one I will introduce, uh, who will then do the honor of introducing uh, our speaker. But the other member I want to represent, uh, recognize here is our state senator, uh, State Senator Freddie Paul Sims. Uh, let's give her a round of applause for being here. It's a pleasure to have you here, always Senator Sims. And in a moment, I'll recognize the other member of the General Assembly who will introduce our speaker. But it's an opportunity for our students to hear from a member of the General Assembly, in fact, the leader of the General Assembly, just how government in Georgia works. We really appreciate the joys and the frustrations and the difficulties of government from afar. When we get the opportunity to hear from members of the General Assembly just what they do on our behalf, it reminds us just how precious democracy is and how we should not take it in the least bit for granted. So I am delighted to welcome you all here because you share the view that democracy cannot and should not be taken for granted. And I'm, as president of Albany State University, delighted to have you join me in welcoming uh, Representative Winford Dukes, who is our senior member of the General Assembly delegation here in Albany, Georgia. Representative Dukes was born and raised in Mitchell County, Georgia. He is the son of Mr. Willie Beatrice Dukes and the late Sylvester Dukes. A product of public school system, he is a 1974 graduate of Mitchell County High School, presently Mitchell Baker, where he received the General Excellency Award. He received a bachelor's degree in history with a minor in accounting from Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. He is also has a master's degree in management from Georgia College and State University in Milledgefield, Georgia. Presently, Winfrey Duke serves as a chief executive officer of Dukes Edwards and Duke Inc., a family-owned construction real estate firm based in Albany, Georgia. He has a, received numerous awards and honors for outstanding contributions in business and community service, including the Georgia Summit of the African American Business Organizations of Wolf Impact and Certif Certif of Appreciation of Albany State University Entrepreneurship Project. He received the Omega Psi Phi Citizen of the Year Award in 1993, 1997, and 1999. He also received the Georgia State's Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Citizen Award for 2000 and the Georgia Rural Health Association of Legislature of the Year Award in 2000. Representative Dukes was recognized by the Georgia Municipal Association as champion of Georgia sites in 2004. Representative Dukes. Thank you, Mr. Percy. Um, a wise and a distinguished and renowned educator. Benjamin E. Mays once said that it is your environment. It is not your environment, but it is the quality of your minds, the integrity of your soul, and the determination of your will that will determine your future and will shape your lives. I have rarely met anyone with a sharper mind, a greater integrity, and a sheer determination of will than our guest speaker this afternoon, the House Democratic Leader of the Georgia General Assembly, Representative Stacey Abrams. As Democratic Leader, Representative Abrams became the first African American and the first woman to lead the House of Representatives. She has led the fight to protect and to preserve Hope Scholarship, a fair and a comprehensive tax policies for Georgia families, and has worked to ensure that all of George, Georgia's children will have access to a quality education. She is no stranger to business or to public service with a strong dedication and a commitment to uplifting the quality of life for all of the citizens of Georgia. She has served as a deputy city attorney for the city of Atlanta and serves on the boards of trustees of St. Joseph Healthcare Systems and Agnes Scott College. 
She is a member of the boards of directors of the Gateway Center for the Homeless and the King Institute of Ethics at Duke University, Literacy Actions, and a number of other boards. She has been involved in a number of entrepreneurial ventures, co-founding a financial services firm, Now Account, Network Cooperations, and Nourish Inc a beverage company for, that focuses on infants and toddlers. Academic and intellectual preparation has been the foundation to Mrs. Abrams' development. First, matriculating just as you are here to an HBCU, Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. They're receiving a degree in interdisciplinary studies. She furthered her education by graduating from the University of Texas with an MPA degree in public policy. She later received her Jewish doctorate degree from the Yale School of Law. Now our speaker is a very talented young lady. She, has, she is a noted author, having penned eight romance novels, romance and suspense novels, selling more than 100,000 copies. She has published a number of articles on issues ranging, ranging from public policy, taxation, and nonprofit organizations for a number of national periodicals. Stacy has been the recipient of a number, numerous awards and recognitions, one being 12 one of 12 rising legislators to watch in the nation by Governing Magazine and one of the 100 most influential Georgians by Georgia Trend. She was a legislator of the year for Georgia for the Healthcare Alliance uh, Hospitals, public servant of the year by the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and a number of other awards. Her committee assignments or appropriations ethics, judiciary, non-civil, rules, and ways and means. She represents the people of House District 84. It was Dr. Mays who says that whatever one touches, his aim should always be to leave that which he touches a better place than what he found it. Representative Abrams has touched the General Assembly. She has touched the people of the great state of Georgia, and both are better because she came our way. I'm proud to introduce to you a true servant of the people, an individual with wisdom and a strong intestinal fortitude. I'm proud to introduce to you my leader, the Honorable Stacey Abrams. Um, I want to first say thank you to Dr. Freeman and to Dr. Woodward for inviting me here and my good friend Anita Tucker who I have served on a, a panel with for the last seven years, I think, six or seven years. We basically spend, our, we spend one week, uh, one day a year scaring juniors in college, so um, look out. Okay, so I've been asked to talk to you about three things. Uh, one, why I do what I do. Two, why you should do some of the stuff I do. And three, why it matters. And you all look really excited to hear about all of those things. Especially you right there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. See, there you go. See, smile at me. I'm a politician. I respond well to smiles. It makes me very happy. And it makes me talk faster. So y'all can get out of here. OK. Um, Representative Dukes, uh, I, I greatly appreciate the, the introduction. And when he talked about my history, uh, I went to Spelman College by accident. My, my parents, my mother tricked me into it. I had no interest in going to Spelman. I wasn't allowed to date until I was 16 and I was a senior in high school then. So I wasn't going to a girl's school. Um, <laughs> there was no way. And she said, well, just apply. You don't have to go, just apply. And I also didn't really want to go to an HBCU. I'd, I'd grown up in Southern Mississippi where I was the only person of color in all of my classes. And I thought there's no way I'm gonna fit in. 
So I wasn't going anywhere near Spelman. But she said, just apply. You don't have to go, just apply. So I applied and I got in. And she said, well, just go visit. You don't have to attend, just go visit. Because mothers are tricky that way. <laughs> and it was a day off from school, so I went to visit. And two things happened to me. Number one, I met Jeanetta Cole, who was the president of Spelman College. And if you've ever seen or heard her, it's like hearing the voice of God dipped in honey. I mean, she's just, she's amazing. And she's just this remarkable woman. And the second thing was I saw Morehouse College and that solved my dating problem. So <laughs> I then decided to go to Spelman College. Uh, but it was at Spelman that I learned, I think, um, the, the, the fundamentals of what I do now. Uh, I, I learned from my parents. My parents are both Methodist ministers who were very committed when we were growing up to making certain that we were engaged in the life of uh, the lives of others. And they did a lot, though, I'll come back to that. But it was at Spelman College that I really understood why politics mattered. But, but let me take a step back. Uh, I grew up in southern Mississippi. I grew up with weather pretty much like the weather you have here. I grew up on the Gulf of Mexico. And my parents were what they called the genteel poor. My, my, my mother called us genteel poor. We had no money, but we watched PBS. Um, and as genteel poor, we didn't get to go to fast food restaurants. We lived without running water in our house for you know, years at a time. Sometimes the phone was on, sometimes it wasn't. Uh, my parents both worked, but they just didn't have enough money to make ends meet. And in that circumstance, typically what will happen is that as, as children, you get to whine about it. You get to worry about what you don't have. You get to complain. But my parents had both grown up with a lot less than we had. And so they had decided when they became parents that they were going to do something different with us. So we had to spend almost every weekend going to do service, whether it was at a soup kitchen or at a homeless shelter or at a, a juvenile justice center. They made sure that we were serving someone else because what they told us was no matter how little you have, there is someone with less, and it is your job to serve that person. So you might complain about the fact that you don't have new clothes, but I want you to work in a homeless shelter where someone doesn't have anything to wear. Or you might complain about the fact that you can't go to the movies, but I want you to go to a juvenile justice facility and see a child whose parents did such a poor job with them that they don't have freedom. And when you do that, when you are forced as a child, and, and it was forced because I wasn't that nice as a child, but when you are raised in, a, in an environment where service is a part of who you are, then what you learn is that service is a part of everything you do. And so I grew up with a belief in service that has really generated most of the decisions I've made in my life. But when my mom tricked me into going to Spelman, I, I, I met the second part of what I thought was going to build who I was, and that was government. I'd had a very complicated relationship with government when I was growing up. Because uh, as I said, you know, my parents, we grew up very poor, so we were on and off of welfare. Um, government, my, my dad fell off of scaffolding when he was working and shattered his arms and his legs, and it took seven years to get his workers' comp claim. Seven years where they bickered over whether or not he was actually hurt. Now, mind you, the x-ray showed that he couldn't use his arms or his legs, but they weren't certain he was disabled. And that was a government issue. That was a, it was a politics issue. And because of that, I understood how important it was to have access to power, to have access to government, to have a voice with people who were making choices for you. But it was the same government that paid for me to go to college. How many of you have student loans? How many of you have Pell Grants? Yeah, government is really cool because <laughs> government pays for college. Government paid for me to go to a school, a high school, and a junior high school, and an elementary school that was better than the schools my parents went to. And so I, I appreciated what government could do, even though I was very angry with it sometimes. I was angry with a government that could allow my parents to work as hard as they worked for as long as they did and still not be able to pay for their bills. And so when I got to college, I realized that I needed to understand this government thing. Who was making these choices? What, why was my life not like the lives of the kids I went to school with? Because I went to Spelman College, which is basically like an all-girls version of The Cosby Show. Um, I'll tell you this, you know, as you all have probably discovered, once you put aside race, and especially race and gender, you realize there are a whole lot of other reasons to dislike people. And at Spelman College, I really learned to understand diversity because I disliked a lot of women for no other reason than just who they were. It had nothing to do with their race or their gender. Um, and, and part of that was a jealousy that I had because the same government that managed their lives had given them so much more than my family had. And I wanted to understand why. 
And so I spent time my freshman year, I worked for, I was in student government. My sophomore year, I worked for the city of Atlanta. My junior year, I worked for the EPA. My senior year, I worked uh, for the EPA again. And I found different ways to meet government, to figure out what it was doing. I even made up a major. I, I have a degree in interdisciplinary studies, which means I couldn't figure out what I wanted to major in and spell me let me graduate anyway. I'm very serious. And they had to call me one time and ask what was on my diploma because they couldn't remember what they wrote. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, but because of that, what I discovered was that government wasn't the only culprit. There, there are three segments of, of society. There's government, there's the for-profit sector, and there's the nonprofit sector. And there should be this intersection where they work together and support the lives that we have. Where as individuals, if you do what you're supposed to and those systems work the way they're supposed to, you get to be the person you want to be. It doesn't always work out that way. And so my life's mission became understanding that intersection, understanding why it worked for some people and didn't work for others, why some of my colleagues at Spelman had fantastic lives that you all only saw on television, and others of us were standing in line at financial aid office the day that the office opened, hoping after six weeks we'd get our checks and we could afford to buy our books. Why were our lives so different, despite the fact that both of our, but all of us had parents who wanted us to be better? And so with me, what I realized was that I wanted to not just understand government, I wanted to be a part of it. And, and that brings me to what I'm going to talk to you all about. There are three things I want you to do, and it comes from a quote from Arthur Ashe. If you have the exact life that you want, raise your hand. Everybody else needs to listen then. Arthur Ashe said to achieve greatness, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. So say, it, say start where you are. All of y'all come on, say again, say start where you are. My parents are ministers, so I'm also used to call and response, and I can tell when people aren't talking back to me, okay? Start where you are. As college students, whether you are 20 or 25 or 45, you all have started something. You have started to change your lives. You have made the decision to go to school. You've made the decision to get something that no one can ever take away from you. I can lose my business. I can lose my, my job as a minority leader. I can lose my seat. But there's an education that I have that no one can ever take away from me. That is the first step to changing the life that, I, that, that, that led to me changing my life. I started where I was. I started by getting the education I could get because, as my parents told us, education is the one thing no one can take away from you. When you start where you are, you start by making choices that make your lives better. And every single one of you has done that. You are sitting in this room today because you decided to start by not being someone else. You decided to be someone who believed in education, who believed that change could come if you took the time to learn. That is a profound decision to make because we all know people who didn't make that choice. We all know folks who made the decision not to go to school, to not get an education, that, that high school was enough, assuming they even finished high school. And we have friends who dropped out as freshmen or sophomores, some who in their junior year decided they couldn't afford it anymore. But you all have made the choice to be here because you have decided to start where you are. Say, start where you are. The second thing, though, is now that you've started where you are, you have to use what you have. Say, use what you have. Using what you have means that you are in a space now where you have voices that are louder than you can imagine. And if your voices weren't loud, Barack Obama, whether you voted for him or not, but make some assumptions, since 93% of people in the, you know, who look like us voted for him, Barack Obama wouldn't have been president but for young people like you, but for college students waking up on a Tuesday morning and deciding to go and vote instead of deciding to watch television. They used what they had, which was the power of the vote. And that power is going to change your lives because the, the, the other person who was running, he was going to cut Pell Grants. He was going to raise the cost of student loans. How many of you want to pay more for how much it goes to college, costs to go to college? How many of you like Pell Grants being available? How many of you think that there should be more money available for college students? And how many of you would like to have a job when you're done? Those are choices made by people like you who wake up and vote. Those are choices that change your lives forever. Because we all know someone who didn't, who got that close, but couldn't make it all the way because they couldn't afford it. But because you use what you have, 
you have used your ability to be in this classroom, but the next thing is to use your ability, your voice, to vote. And as much as we care about the presidential election, Senator Sims and Representative Dukes and I can tell you that's not the only election that matters. How many of you think Albany is the most perfect city in the world and there's nothing wrong with it? Exactly. You all are citizens of Albany. Whether you are born here, as long as you live here, you have residence here. You should be involved in the life of the city and the life of Doherty County. Because the city of, of Albany and Doherty County make choices about your lives. How many of you think that they're that all the neighborhoods have equal opportunity and they, they all get the resources they need. If you think that should change, that's your voice. There are enough of you, there are 4,260 of you on this campus. That's a city from where I am. That's enough people to change lives. Because if every single one of you decided to wake up and vote, not only for a president, but to go all the way down the ballot and vote for your city council member, vote for your county commissioner, vote for your state senator and your state representative. When you use what you have, which is the power of the vote, you can change a city. And if you don't believe me, think about the Tea Party. Now, whether you agree with them or not, there aren't that many of them, or at least there weren't. But they used their voices and they kept talking and talking until they changed this country. We have discussions as a nation that we never had before, and whether you like it or not, they did it because they use their voices. They use what they have. Say it with me, say use what you have. And what's the first thing you're gonna do? So if you start where you are, which is here at Albany State, and you use what you have, which is your voice, you can do what you can. If you are comfortable that the world is the way it is, then you don't need to listen to anything else I say, and I'm gonna stop talking and give you time to walk out. Okay, y'all decide to stay here, so you're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna use what I can. You have an obligation to not only vote for in the city elections and county elections and, and state elections, you have an obligation to know who's responsible for the life that you live. When you do what you can, that means finding out who's responsible. And if the person who's responsible isn't doing what they can, then you have to make sure they don't get to keep their jobs. Politicians are elected. This is the only job I know of where people hire you give you money, and then go away. Senators Powell Sims, Representative Dukes and I, we are in charge of a budget of $19 billion, which you pay for. Everybody in this room, if you bought a Snickers bar, you have given us money. You hire us to do the job of the state of Georgia, to do the job for Albany, to do the job for Doherty County, to decide the job of this college. When Dr. Freeman comes up to the Capitol to ask for more money for the things that you need, he is coming to talk to the people he hired. But as long as you don't do what you can, then we don't do what we should. We should be held accountable for the things that you need. And there are 4,000 voices here who can demand better from us, who can demand that they get the money they need for the things that you need to do your job, that the communities you drive through where they don't have paved roads or where they don't have the resources you know they deserve, you can be the voices for them. You can do what you can because you have the power to make that change. Now, too often we convince ourselves that we don't have that kind of power. But that kind of power is easy to have. How many times have you been in a room where if you are the only one who speaks up, the, the conversation changes? But too often, young people decide that they don't have a loud enough voice yet. You don't do what you can because you don't know what you have but you have voices and those voices are powerful and those voices are profound. Those voices in 2006 saved not only education, but saved a number of poor children from being kicked off of peach care because it was students just like you who spent two weeks down at the state capitol demanding that children not be kicked off of peach care and they weren't. It was voices like yours that helped stop worse things happening to the Hope Scholarship than have already happened. Your voices change things. You can elect a president. If you can elect a president, you can certainly get a stoplight. If you can elect a president, you can certainly change the lives of those children that you pass. I know that your, your student body president is a, he's going to teach middle grades. He's a, he's a teacher. And that teacher needs your support. If you think that students get enough of what they need in our schools today, then you should be silent. But if you think kids deserve better than what we give them, then we should hear your voices at the Capitol. And I'm going to close by telling you how to do that. First thing I need you to do, well, I'm going to, make, I'm going to circle back, though. First, I need you to do what? Then? And then? Now, I'm going to tell you how to do what you can, and this is it. Number one, I need you to speak up. Say, speak up. Speak up. Tell
tell us what's wrong. Whether you're telling me, telling Representative Dukes, telling Senator Powell, telling your county commissioner, Mr. Johnson, where are you? You have a new county commissioner sitting in this room with you. Maybe he walked out. But you've got a county commissioner. Tell them what's going on. Tell them what you need. Because if you don't tell them, if you don't speak up, we don't know. I represent 53,000 people. I hear from maybe five of them. But when those five people call me, I do what they ask because they figured out who I was. You, if you are willing to speak up and tell us what you need, we will start to listen. So say speak up. The second thing you have to do is stand up. When you've spoken up and told us what's going on, stand up and demand that we do it. We are let you hired us and you can fire us. When you hire people to represent you, you have hired us to do a job for you and you should stand up and demand that we do it. And that can be by calling our office, by coming down to the Capitol or City Hall or the County Commission offices. It can be simply by sending us an email, but take the time to stand up to us and stand up with us. If there's something we're doing that you like, don't just call us when you're mad at us. Call us when we've done something you like. Make us feel better about it. I, I like getting A's. Most of us do. So call us and let us know. Speak up, stand up. And lastly, you have to show up. Say show up. show up. You have to show up at the ballot box. You have to show up when we do things right. But most importantly, you have to show up every single day. You have to show up and be the voice and be the person that you believe the world has called you to be. Because if you are willing to speak up, say it with me, and then stand up, and then you will change this world. And now I will shut up. Thank you. Now, normally I'd make a dramatic exit, but I'm supposed to answer questions. What type of internships do you have available, if any? We do. We have, um, so the caucus has internships. There are two ways we do it. There are legislators who hire legislative aides. And if you're interested, we actually reach out to all of our caucus members to see if they need aides. Those are paid. They don't pay, won't pay a lot, but they pay you enough that you can, you know, live. Um, so we do paid internships. We also have unpaid internships in our office. And those folks work for the caucus. And that means that we have work that we ask you to do, research projects, things like that. One thing we're looking into is actually during the session having local internships where we ask you to do things on the ground. So whether rather than being up at the Capitol, there are things we're going to ask folks to do in locations where we're trying to build our, our network and let people know what we're going, what we're doing. So if you reach out to me, I'm happy to give you information about all three. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There's someone in the back. How you doing, I'm Joshua Hicks? Um, I was looking at the paper and I saw you from District 84. Mm -hmm. So where, I have two questions. Where is that located and what are some accomplishments or some things you've done in that district? Sure. So District 84 is City of Atlanta, DeKalb County. So if you know Atlanta, 80% of Atlanta sits in Fulton County, 20% sits in DeKalb County, and I represent 60% of the part that sits in the City of Atlanta. And then I represent Southern DeKalb County, so going down towards 285. Um, as state legislator for that district, a lot of what I've done has been focused on just answering constituent concerns. So I have a very heavy minority, not minority, I have a very high elderly population. Uh, so I've worked with that elderly population to get them services. Um, we do an annual, uh, not only Thanksgiving, but Christmas basket for our senior citizens to make sure they have access. Um, I've done a lot of work um, for the educational communities because my district covers City of Atlanta schools, DeKalb County Schools and City of Decatur Schools. Uh, so I've served on commissions and worked with those different school districts to make sure they get the resources they need. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thanks again for coming to Albany State. Absolutely. Um, being a student leader, how can I get um, the students more involved in politics and make it more attractive for them to want to be involved in it? Well, and that's a great question. The question was, how can you get students more involved in, in politics? I got my start in politics at, at Spelman. I was a freshman class secretary because that was the only job no one else was running for. Um, so it was my best election ever. Uh, and then I got appointed as a sophomore to be the sophomore media specialist um, because I was the only person who knew how to use the camera. And it was a made up job. So my first two political jobs were great. Then I ran for student body vice president and then student body president. And what I found in every one of those jobs, my first campaign, when I ran for a student uh, body vice president, my campaign slogan was right now. There was a song by Van Halen, which very few people 
new, but I, I liked Van Halen. Anyway, and the, what I did was I put up signs all across campus that said right now, and I would put different things that were happening. Uh, for example, at Spelman, I lived in LLC one, which was like the really nice dorm, but in LLC in Howard Herald, which was sort of one of the older dorms, LLC one had two ply toilet paper. Uh, Herald, Howard Herald had one ply, which I found just to be morally wrong. Why did I deserve two ply toilet paper? And when I would go to visit my friends, I'm like, what is this crappy paper you have? And so I've, I put up signs that said, right now, you know, LLC two has LLC one has two ply toilet paper. That's wrong. Or when you were when you were going through financial aid, it took us. It would take three weeks to get something processed, and you'd have to stand in line for hours. And that was, and I, right now, I'm like, right now, I'm not going to graduate because I'm standing in line. And I'm not going to class. So I put up signs like that. And what I found was that more people became involved in my campaign because they understood the issues because it it's, it resonated for them. I mean, you guys laugh because you recognize what I'm talking about. The way to get people involved in politics is for people to relate politics to the people. Politics matters when you know that it touches your life. So figure out the issues that matter to your students. Too often, the, the, the instinct of politicians is to tell people what they need to know. Because we think, because somebody's elected us, that we know more than they do. The issue is we know more than at least one person. One person more liked us than they liked the other guy. That's not, that's not a mandate. <laughs> that's, you know, that's luck and possibly charisma. But if you want people to be engaged, give them things to be engaged about. Talk to them about the issues that matter to them and create a space for them to tell you. People love to complain. Oprah Winfrey made a billion dollars off of that. We all know people love to complain. They love to hear themselves talk. Create forums for people to come and tell you what they're concerned about. And then when they give you solutions, try to help them. The best way to get people engaged in politics is to, to, to not only find out what their needs are, but help them solve those needs. Because when they can connect a problem with a solution, they will realize that you can be part of helping their lives get better. But more importantly, they realize that they can be part of getting, making their lives better. Question I have, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, issue or not, but you know here at Albany State University, we're waiting on a fine arts building. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually talked to the legislators here. Um, I've even lobbied my legislators at home. They both have the thick packets um, about the proposed building. So I want to know, as a student body here at Albany State, you know, we've heard about a possible funding for the building and that it may be coming. But, you know, personally, I'm tired of hearing that. Um, so what can we do? as a student body to lobby our officials um, more and to lobby the state legislators to get the funding for this building. Okay. Well, I will give credit to at least two of your legislators who, while I was sitting in that seat, lobbied me about your fine arts building, so they've heard you. But the reality is those two people cannot make a choice about you getting your money. They are two votes out of 400, sorry, yeah, 436. No, I'm, I'm doing Congress. Uh, <laughs> 236. 236 votes. In the House, there are 180 members. We need 91 votes in the House. In the Senate, there are 56 members. So you need 27 members in the Senate. They can't do it by themselves. So it, your, your first step is to speak up to them. But the next thing you have to do is stand up. That means stand up to the rest of us. I've never heard from you. I don't know who you are. I do now. But I'm one of those votes. If you only talk to two people, you get two votes. You have to talk to all of us. Let us say no to you. Too often we talk ourselves out of things. How many of you have ever wanted to go out with somebody but you didn't say anything because you were afraid they were going to say no? Mm -hmm. How many of you wanted something but you didn't bother to ask because you knew the answer would be no? We, all talk, we, talk, we talk ourselves out of success. We convince ourselves. I have been humiliated in multiple ways and I have found that while it's embarrassing, it's not debilitating. I get over it. I trip over random patches of air all the time. And it used to be I would just be mortified by it. And then I realized, eh, you know, as long as I don't break anything, I'm good. <laughs> when you want something, you have to ask the people who can give it to you. The person who can give you money is the governor of Georgia. If 4,000 students from Albany State called his office every single day and demanded that fine arts building, I promise you, you would suddenly have attention paid to that. If 4,000 students called all 236 members of the Georgia General Assembly and called us every week, just every week, all of you, just, just ring our phones, we will do it just to get rid of you. <laughs> but more than that, the thing is about politicians, and, and I, I like being a politician. I am one of, so I say these things a bit glibly, but seriously. Politicians are like 14-year-old girls. We respond to money, peer pressure, and attention. 
okay? Y'all don't have any money, so you can't do anything for me there. <laughs> You're not my peers, so you can't do much to me there, but you can, put, you can pay attention to me. If you pay attention to me and it's the wrong kind of attention, it's amazing how quickly people correct their behavior when they get the wrong kind of attention. We are politicians. If you will put the wrong kind of attention on us, figure out which other schools have gotten buildings lately. Because I'm fairly certain Georgia Tech or Georgia State or UGA has recently gotten some building they need. Let us know that and, and make us explain why they got something and you didn't. I can't promise you'll get it, but I promise it'll be harder to say no to you. And if, you, if you're consistent about it, if you're persistent about it, then something will happen. You may not get a full fine arts building, but I promise you you'll get some, you'll get some response. But if I don't know what's going on, I the rest of my colleagues don't either. You've got two fine representatives, but they need your help. They need an army behind them. You can't send in the generals and while, while the army stays home. So you all, if, if it's something you want, you have to be willing to speak up for it. For students who might be aspiring for a public office, want to be elected someday, I've heard of that fire in the belly that you have to have when you run for office. Please describe what it is. And some of, some of us may not be students, me um, in that number, aspire to political office one day. What is it that we have to have? Uh, running for office, you don't have to, not everyone's going to be Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Uh, Mr. Dukes and, 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 and Ms. Powell Sims can tell you I'm not the most excited member of the General Assembly. Um, most people would not describe me as outgoing. <laughs> I'm not, uh, but I can be the person I need to be for the community I'm around. Um, so, and I don't say that to mean that I'm, I'm, I'm insincere, but we all adapt ourselves to the spaces we're in. When we go to church, we don't sing, you know, we don't sing really loud and we don't sing rock, you know, raunchy songs because you're in a space where that's not appropriate. When you're in the library, you whisper. You, you match, you, you fix yourself and the way you behave to the place where you are. The same thing is true in politics. I wanted to be in politics because I don't like things. I, I find poverty to be a moral abomination. It, it, is, it is morally wrong and is economically inefficient. So both emotionally and intellectually, I don't understand why we have it. That has driven me most of my life. And so for me, I've, I've worked in government. I've worked for government. I've worked in the private sector, I've worked in the nonprofit sector. And what I discovered is that government is the space that has the most direct ability to correct the things that I think are wrong. And the best way to make that happen was for me to run for office. It was hard. I don't like talking to people. I don't like shaking their hands. I don't like knocking on their doors and having them shut them in my face. I don't like being told no. I really don't like being told no. And so running for office is hard. But the fire in the belly that you're describing is just determination. As much as I don't like being told no, I don't like the things I don't like even more. I think it is wrong for us to make choices about poor people's lives without them having a voice. I think taking away the right to vote for any person is, is immoral. I think that it is critical that every child have an education that is worthy of the word. And so those are things I'm willing to work hard for. And so I get over my, I'm not shy, I'm more reserved, but I get over my, my, my reservation because I know that I've got to be the voice that they need. So the fire in the belly can be that you're excited about being in politics, or it can be that you're excited about an issue. But you have to want this, you have to want the job more than you don't want the hardship. Because as they will both tell you, I mean, she's got, I think, at the last count, 117 counties in her district. Um, but when you've got to walk and knock on 20,000 doors, when you've got to raise a lot of money, I mean, I just spent the last, six months raising money on behalf of all of our members so we could, we could get new members into the General Assembly. I spent a lot of time begging, and I don't enjoy begging, but I spent a lot of time doing it because it was, worth, it was more worth it to me that we add those seats than my embarrassment or my resistance to, to doing that. So the fire in the belly is nothing more than your commitment to getting what you think you need to do things for others. But if you ever run for office for your personal need, then you're going to have that office for a very short period of time. But when you run for office because of other people, that's when you see things happen, and that's when things start to change. Because even the politicians you don't like, they're doing it for some, some larger reason. Usually it's wrong, but they've got some larger reason for doing it. But make sure that when you're running that that's your focus. Um, the sort of short version of this is you know, run when you're ready, figure out what you're going to do, figure out why you are the person to do it, and then tell as many people as you can. That's all elections are. It's finding more people than the other guy to vote for you. 
And typically people find a few people and they think they've done their job and that's when they get beaten. Um, if you are relentless and you find the number of people, you just have to find one more than the other guy and that's how you win an election. Hi, my name is uh, Richard Mason. I'm a visiting assistant professor here. Uh, also, Howard Thurman Hall, if you know that. If you know I that do. Means. Yes, yes, great, great. Well, I was curious, uh, can you give me an example of some bills that you worked on or introduced that were specifically tailored toward helping HBCUs in the Georgia area? No. I, I, well, because I've never introduced legislation. Okay. Um, but let me tell you why. Uh, when I got to the General Assembly, I'd, I'd been the deputy city attorney, so my job had been to work for the city of Atlanta and figure out what the state was doing for us and to us. So I spent a lot of time over at the Capitol learning about legislation. What I realized is we pass a lot of laws to fix problems that we've already passed laws for. So instead of solving problems, we just pass new laws. And so I, I, I don't think we need to pass as many laws as we pass. The solution for HBCUs is not passing more laws. The solution for HBCUs is funding them. That funding only changes when you change the number of people in the General Assembly who like HBCUs. There aren't enough of us right now. So my focus is on getting people elected who believe in the things I believe in. And so my focus has not been on passing laws because, I'll, I mean, put it this way, there are 60 Democrats. In this upcoming session, there will be 60 Democrats and 119 Republicans. All of you can do math. If I pass a single bill, it will be because they have done something horribly wrong. It will not be because I am so right. Our solutions sometimes don't come from inside. I mean, and President Obama said this when he was running, you know, when he, during his, when he accepted um, the nomination in uh, Charlotte. You, know, you are the ones who are the change. We can only do so much because we've got one vote each. But if we've got 4,000 people behind us, our votes sound a lot bigger, and our voices sound a lot bigger. My personal approach to solving the issue of HBCUs is to, when, for example, when we were working on the Hope Scholarship, what I found was that, based on the numbers, more HBCU students needed a low-interest loan program than the Hope Scholarship because they weren't keeping it at the same levels. They needed a low-interest loan program, which we'd had on the books for five years but had never funded. So I worked with the governor, and part of I mean, it was controversial, but we got that funded. We got $30 million put into this low interest, low interest loan program, which HBCU students can now use. Um, I've worked with the appropriations to refund money that had been taken out of the budget for Morehouse School of Medicine. Twice now, we've had to put about $12 million back in the budget. And they keep forgetting that Morehouse School of Medicine produces more general practitioner doctors in the state of Georgia than almost any other medical school. And, but when you think about GPs, those are the folks who treat us. So I haven't done specific legislation but I found other ways to address those issues because the other thing we have to remember is legislation isn't the only way to get things done. It's a good way, but it's the way that works best when you're in charge. When you're not in charge, you have to use guerrilla tactics and that means find out other ways to get what you need. And if you can't get what you need, at least make it uncomfortable for them to do something against you. Hello, Representative Abrams. My name is Carrie Loft and I wanna thank you for coming out as well. My question, um, I'm a political science major here at Albany State and I'm very passionate about the issues that affect me and my community. One being the um, dissymmetry in the penal systems, the correction systems. Mm -hmm. um, uh, President Obama in his last term, I know that he made a step toward to try and kind of level the playing field by um, initiating the Fairness and Sentencing Act that kind of repelled the sentencing from 100 to 1 to 10 to 1 for cocaine, which um, affects African-American men heavily. But what can we do in Georgia to try and make that um, maybe retroactive? Um, and how can we help those that may have already been punished under the previous laws? And what can we do um, going forward to ensure that African-American men don't fall victim to um, unfair legislation and things like that in Georgia? OK. So first and foremost, the Fairness and Sentencing Act um, is retroactive. It's not retroactive because, by and large, here's what it is. There are some sentences that were based on the 100 to 1 crack cocaine. To, so the, the issue was, you know, crack cocaine was char you, you were sentenced at about 100 to 1, meaning that if you had a gram of, of crack and 100 grams of cocaine, you got the same sentence. And that meant that because, you know, basically the people who bought crack were poor and black and the people who bought cocaine were rich and white, white people got lesser sentences than black people did. Um, although it's true that in um, communities in like Appalachia and some other communities and, and poor white communities, they were also affected, but it disproportionately affected African-American men. 
So what President Obama and the White House did in cooperation with Congress was basically repeal the unfair sentencing. The challenge was that a number of those sentences were concurrent sentences that were mixed with other things. So it wasn't just that you were carrying crack. You had crack and you had a gun or you had crack and it was your third strike. So there were all these other things that were involved. And so retroactivity as a blanket wasn't permissible because you had to unravel all of these other things. But um, my, my younger sister is actually a US attorney, assistant U.S. attorney, so she this is part of her job. So they are working through a number of those cases to try to see what they can do to reduce sentences. But there are some sentences that just won't be reduced because of how, how they were structured. That's federal. Uh, black men have a different issue on the state level. Um, which is that we also passed really, really draconian laws that gave higher sentences. We have mandatory minimums. So if you commit a crime and you get convicted of it, the judge has almost no discretion. Um, I will give uh, Governor Purdue, I'm sorry, good Lord, Governor Deal, <laughs> sorry, thinking about chicken. Um, I will give Governor Deal a great deal of credit. He has initiated the um, Criminal Justice Reform Council. And he's actually looking at how we can address the very high prison rates that we have in Georgia, which basically means looking at how you can reduce the number of people of color, men of color, and actually the growing population in prisons are women of color, reducing that, po that prison population. Last year, um, and again, uh, Representative Dukes and Senator Powell Sims were both uh, supporters of this. They actually, we reduced the um, threshold for theft, which sounds small, but often people pay for their crack by stealing stuff from other people. They pay for their mistakes, by they, they, they steal. And so by changing the sentencing guidelines and the threshold for what qualified as a theft um, and for property crimes, we actually started to reduce the number of people who will be sentenced. The other piece is that Governor, Purdue, Governor Deal has worked very hard, uh, and I serve on the commission that's looking at this, uh, at expanding alternative courts. So drug courts, DUI courts, mental health courts, uh, finding other ways to address criminal behavior beyond sending, sending people to prison. And Governor Deal actually said something that I agree with, which is that when you put someone in prison, you should put someone in prison because they're dangerous, not because you're mad at them. And so he has been very intentional about reducing that. But I go to these meetings, in fact, there's one tomorrow. I've never seen, I rarely see anyone in the room other than a handful of advocates. So you've got a bunch of us making choices, and these are public meetings. They've been in the newspaper. Nobody shows up. There's going to be one in Tifton uh, coming up. Um, you should be there. Because if we don't hear the voices of the people, then we don't have the political cover we need to make those big choices. Because people can all agree that you should let more people, that we should reduce the sentences until they realize you mean somebody who's going to come and live in their neighborhood. People are all for being fair until that fairness affects them. So unless the communities that care about this are vocal in this, then things don't change. And that's the point, part of what I was saying. Use what you have. You are, I mean, Albany has a fairly high population that's affected by this. There should be people from Albany coming to those hearings saying, please do these things. But if we don't hear from you, we are going to make it up, and you do not want us to do that. You do not want us making up solutions for you. So you have to be the voice. You have to use what you have and what you can do. If I say do what you can, what you can do is come to those meetings. Come to those meetings and write us letters. Send a letter to the governor and copy the people who are on that criminal justice reform council and tell us, here are the things that you're concerned about and here's why you think those things need to change. And whether you're talking about criminal justice reform or schools or whatever the issue is, let us hear from you. I mean, my colleagues will tell you, if we hear from five people, that's a big deal. If we hear from 50, that's an emergency. If we hear from 500, I'm surprised y'all could all find us. So we will do things, or we will at least respond, but we have to hear from you about those issues. But the state is working on it, but the state and the federal issues are, are separate. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you again. I'll add my thanks uh, to everybody else for coming. I really have enjoyed being here. I um, wanted to ask if you could tell us any of the pressing things that are going on as far as health care reform, as far as how Georgia is going to respond. We're hearing a lot of different people say different things about how other states are going to do it, but I'd like to know what Georgia is going to do. I would too. Um, so where we are now is that Governor Deal has declined. So uh, the Affordable Care Act is law. Uh, there is unlikely to be any attempt, any real attempt to repeal it. There's been a little bit of rumbling from uh, House uh, Speaker Boehner that he's going to demand some repeals to Obamacare in exchange for the fiscal cliff. I don't think that's going to work uh, because President Obama has very clearly signaled that he wants both of those things. And 
apparently he got his swagger back, so he's, he's not gonna, I don't think he's gonna budge on those. Um, that said, what then happens is that if, if the Affordable Care Act is gonna stay in place, the question is for Georgia, two things. One, the healthcare exchanges, which are an online small business, basically an online exchange where different providers come together so that citizens can buy cheaper health insurance. Um, it won't take effect until 2014, but states were supposed to send their initial notice of whether they were going to participate by November 16th. Governor Deal declined to participate. He said, there, there are three things you could do. The states could do it themselves, they could do it in cooperation with the federal government, or they could give it to the federal government. The state of Georgia has decided to give it to the federal government to do. So our, our small, um, our health exchange will be run by the federal government and it will be put in place in 2014. However, the federal government's not going to do this in isolation. They're going to reach out to people to say, what do you want? We have to pay attention because if we don't speak up, they're going to do stuff we don't want. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is the Medicaid expansion. Uh, the, the Supreme Court decision on health care said that states could not be compelled to expand Medicaid. That is incredibly dangerous for Georgia. Um, given our population of, uh, of our, our population that needs Medicaid expansion, if we don't expand Medicaid, there, there's both a, a human issue and a fiscal issue. The fiscal issue is that Georgia currently has about a $500 million hole in our Medicaid trust fund, meaning we owe more than we've got, and we owe it to the federal government we keep saying nasty things to. Not the best business model I've ever heard of. On top of that, if we don't make up that, we, we run the risk of forfeiting an additional two-thirds of what we get for, for Medicaid dollars. Medicaid is not just money for poor people. Medicaid pays for poor people, it pays for special needs, it pays for the disabled, and it pays for nursing care. So if you know anybody who's older, and Georgia has a fast aging population, a lot of whom live in South Georgia, this pays for their nursing home care. So if we don't accept Medicaid expansion, we are going to forfeit $40 billion. To draw down that $40 billion, we have to put in $4.5 billion. But the return on investment by the most conservative estimates is $72 billion, meaning that if we are willing to do that, the employment rates for Georgians go up dramatically. The economic capacity of Georgia goes up dramatically. And the people who need that, not the poor, because the, the poor who qualify for Medicaid already qualify. It's that group of people who make too much money to be poor, but not enough money not to be poor. Those are the people who would who benefit from expansion, and those are the people who need the resources. Um, we're going to talk about this in the next few weeks. I believe that there are things that the uh, Republican-led majority needs, and I think that the balance has to be that Medicaid expansion has to be on the table. I'm a very strong advocate for it. I think it's the right thing to do, but we have to be sophisticated about how we ask for it, and we have to figure out what we can do to incentivize them to do it. But that's not to stop you all from writing the governor right now and asking for him to adopt Medicaid expansion and to accept the money. Because all he's got to do is say yes. Thank you so much for that dynamic call to action. Um, you are a Truman Scholar. Would you talk about that experience, how it has prepared you for the position that you're in, and why students here ought to consider it? Yes. Okay, raise your hand if you are a sophomore or a junior. Okay. So. If you are a junior, so I'm telling sophomores too because you can get started. Um, my junior year, I was walking across campus at Spelman, I saw the sign that said, if you do community service, there's a scholarship worth $30,000, please apply. I went and found that scholarship. I'd never heard of it before, it was called the Truman Scholarship. When President Truman, uh, when, he was, when he was aging, they wanted to build a statue for him. And he said, I don't want a statue. He said, I want a living monument to the work I did. So instead of him getting a statue, because if you go to DC, you'll find a statue of Lincoln, one of Kennedy, he has a scholarship because he wanted a living monument. So the money that would have gone to build the statue for him instead goes to pay for 75 college juniors to get a scholarship. Your first year you get um, $2,500, but then you get twenty. sorry, you get $5,000, then you get $25,000 for graduate school. That's one part of it. But the second part is that you get these different experiences. So when I won, I was a, I was, um, a Truman Scholar at Spelman. And so I was technically the, the, one of two Truman Scholars for the state of Mississippi. Uh, once we won, we go to Missouri to where Harry Truman was raised. And you basically spend a week in nerd boot camp. You meet all these other people who are nerdy like you. And you talk about policy stuff. 
Um, and then the following summer, 40 of you of the fifth of the 75 get selected for sort of a nerd version of the real world. You all live in a dorm together and you work for different uh, government agencies. Uh, it was transformative. Um, I'd never thought about, I, I, I'm, and, and I, I am very grateful to Representative Dukes for describing me as eloquently as he did and as, as um, thoughtfully as he did. I, I, you know, I thought I was smart. I didn't really think I was that smart. Um, and it was through the Truman Scholarship that I was encouraged to apply for a Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, I, I tell you that only to say that uh, when I applied for the Rhodes Scholarship, I was the first black woman to ever make it to the finals from the state of Mississippi in the entire history of the Rhodes Scholarship. Um, I wouldn't have tried for that had it not been for the Truman. Uh, the Truman is more than just a scholarship. It is an access point to all of these other things you don't know about. Uh, I met people I never would have met. I got to travel to places I wouldn't have known about because of this one experience. Plus, the money is really, really nice. It is hard to say no to $30,000 to do public service. And basically, the money is designed to let people who think they want to do public service but don't think they can afford it, it says, we'll pay for graduate school for you, or at least pay a lot of your graduate school so you can do the job that you want to do. Uh, and so most Truman Scholars end up going into public service at some point. You don't have to go immediately, but it helps subsidize. And the thing is, once you've won a Truman, then other people give you money. It's kind of like, you know, you can't get hired unless you have a job. You can't get a job unless you've had experience. Well, once people say they like you with a Truman, then other people give you money, so it makes it easier. Um, but if you are interested, you should find Dr. Tucker and talk to her about it. Because if you're a junior, the application, I think the application is already due. Oh, February. So you should talk to Dr. Tucker about that. But if you're a sophomore, you should start planning for it because it is really nice money. And you have to write an essay. You have to fill this application but when, and you go to an interview. But if you win, your life changes dramatically. And it, I mean, it's an amazing opportunity. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Davies Atkins. Um, could you tell me the area of concentration of your um, JD? Yes. So I, okay. So here's the thing about law school. People who say they go to law school to major in something are usually, they don't know what they're talking about. Usually you don't figure out what you're going to focus on until your third year because your first year you take all the classes they make you take. Your second year you take all the classes you need to take to pass the bar exam. Your third year is really when you start to specialize. But I'm a tax lawyer by training. There was a lot of information given to you guys today, but I hope you heard the words that Representative Abrams spoke to you, especially in, uh, related to your wishes from the General Assembly this, this coming year. So someone will be in touch with you about that later on. But thank you so very, very much. Uh, she is an awesome leader, and this is our leader in the legislature, and we appreciate you coming to South Georgia. We do know in the Department of History and Political Science that politics is life, and life is politics. Although the definition is always saying that is the uh, study of who gets what, when, and how. But we know in order to get who gets what and how, you have to be in the, in the game of, of politics. So we do that. And our students are doing a wonderful job of that. Even today, uh, our chief of staff, uh, Dr. Tucker, brought justices, judges, that I spoke with also today. I want to thank Dr. Tucker, Woodard for what you are doing. It's, it's important because we are trying to build the next generation. Building the next generation is doing what we are doing. And that is exactly what Stacey Abrams is doing. We are very happy for you. And our president is always there. And I know he will always be there for us. And I thank you for supporting these uh, activities. Our dear senator, Senator Sims Powell, I've known her since the beginning, and we are still in touch. Uh, Winfrey Brooks, I really appreciate your coming to even to the class of uh, Dr. Woodard this last week. We thank you for everything that you are doing for us, and I will assure you that we will speak up, we will stand up, and we will surely show up. The, uh, the issue of our, uh, of our building should be something that we have to get done. And on behalf of the College of Arts and Humanities, especially our dean, who is so, I, I, I always feel for the dean because he, he talks about that all the time. 
he talks about you know if I sometimes I decided to be playing lottery. I say if I win the lottery, any moment I will just say how much does this building cost, and I will pay for it because of Dr. Bynum. We thank you so much, and we want you to continue to help Auburn State University. Thank you. <laughs>